Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for attending today's event. Uh, my name is Paul Martin. I'm the uh, Deputy Director General for Innovation in the Department of Tourism and Innovation. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and their elders past and present. And I'd also like to welcome those coming in from around the world on our live stream. Uh, Minister, we're very pleased today to welcome Leanne Enoch, the Minister for the Environment and Science, but also, more importantly, the Minister for the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the Minister has been also a, a champion of the Small Business Innovation Research Initiative. Sorry, frog my throat. <laughs> Minister, would you like to say a few words to open the event? I'm joking. I'm joking. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, Paul, um, good to see you getting so emotional about me being here. It's lovely. Uh, let me begin, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather. And in doing so, may I acknowledge the more than 3,000 generations of Turrbal people and Yagra people who have maintained cultural practices on this country. And can I acknowledge all of our elders from wherever you come from, whatever your culture, wherever you might be in the world. Uh, those that are past and those still with us guiding us into the future. Can I of course acknowledge all of our panellists that are, uh, will be sharing their um, knowledge with us uh, throughout this uh, info exchange session. Uh, and can I also acknowledge the many departmental people that are here uh, that have been dedicating their lives uh, to this kind of work. Uh, and also all of you who have come to bring your great expertise and your great minds to this incredibly complex challenge. Uh, can I also acknowledge uh, Minister Kate Jones, who is the Minister for Innovation in this state, and uh, let me tell you, who is an absolute uh, pocket rocket, uh, and she will be bringing some incredible energy to this area. So I know uh, she was um, uh, very sad not to be here today. Uh, can I also acknowledge, um, in his absence, the Director General of the Department uh, that has the responsibility for innovation. Uh, he also has been taking on um, the role around innovation with um, great gusto. Uh, but today, it is my absolute pleasure to be here to talk to you about our $2 million Coral Abundance Challenge, which is calling for innovative solutions to improve coral coverage and health of the Great Barrier Reef. This challenge falls within the Small Business Innovation Research Program, part of our $513 million whole of government Advanced Queensland Initiative and is jointly funded through the Australian Government's Reef Trust. Our SBIR program is an important one for Queensland, seeking out innovative solutions to complex, out of the ordinary problems and calling on great minds from across Australia and around the globe. In this instance, the problem we've identified is to do with the health of the Great Barrier Reef and the impact of climate change on this globally significant natural wonder. The parameters of this challenge are clear. It is to research, develop and test solutions which support the protection, regeneration and recovery of coral populations uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, all of you here know, although the Great Barrier Reef is still alive and it is a beautiful place to visit, and I encourage everybody to uh, make sure that you spend some time on our beautiful reef, uh, it has experienced some severe stress. Uh, the reef has suffered from back-to-back -back, uh, bleaching events in the summers of 2016 and 2017, and of course has endured tropical cyclones, uh, all of which have had negative uh, impact on coral health. Now we're seeking out innovators to develop smart solutions which will help to support coral abundance in these challenging um, circumstances. So if you're eager to help solve one of the most pressing challenges of our time, today's Information Exchange Day is an opportunity for you to get your specific questions answered by a panel of subject, uh, yeah, subject matter experts. Uh, additionally, it provides you with the chance to network and identify potential partners who you could collaborate with to extend the scope of your work. Uh, there are a few things that you must consider, though, in your solution. The Great Barrier Reef is a place of great significance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, our, the First Nations people of this state. It's also a World Heritage Site of supreme ecolo ecological, cultural and economic significance with an estimated 69,000 people employed by industries associated with the Great Barrier Reef. So we ask that solutions are conscious of traditional owners. And as I've stated earlier, you know, we're talking about 
more than 3,000 generations of people who have had connection to that place. And the multiple users of the reef, including tourism operators, uh, recreational and commercial fishers, and of course visitors. We are also looking for submissions that are, su are sustainable, uh, efficient, and of course cost effective. So as we celebrate International Year of the Reef uh, in 2018, uh, it would be incredibly fitting if one of your amazing ideas, your big ideas, turned it the tide for our Great Barrier Reef. So thank you for channeling your talent and passion into our SBIR challenge, um, the Coral Abundance Challenge. Uh, I'm looking forward to what we see uh, come forward and no doubt uh, we will see something absolutely exceptional uh, come out of this particular challenge. So thank you and good luck to everybody. Thank you. Minister, thank you and thank you for your coming today and sharing your time with us. Um, I would like to also to say that the Australian Institute of Marine Science is actually running another Reef Science event in the State Library today, so we're very fortunate to be here at Reef Science Central. Um, in terms of uh, just some housekeeping, in the event of a fire, the exits are up the top to the left and right, and the facilities are located uh, outside. It's also great to be here to acknowledge the fact that this Reef Challenge is actually being addressed in collaboration. As the Minister knows, innovation is a team sport. It requires a lot of people working together. And I do want to acknowledge the fact that the Queensland Government is working together with the Australian Government uh, to deliver this challenge because of a shared commitment to the reef. And as I say, we're all here today for one reason, because we are concerned about the reef. What I'd like to do today is just to give you a little bit of background about Advanced Queensland, which is the overarching initiative, as the Minister said, that is sponsoring this effort today. What we know is that we face a world of increasing uncertainty of pressures, of digitalisation, of globalisation. This is, poses tremendous challenges for us, but also it brings the world together in the sense that the challenges that face the Great Barrier Reef are not just Australia's challenges, they're not just Queensland's challenges, they're the world's challenges. And we hope that the world can help us solve those challenges through this exercise. To date, uh, as the Minister said, Advanced Queensland has been very much focused on an economic agenda with a very simple proposition that innovation equals economic growth equals jobs. But equally, innovation is about solving the great challenges of our time. And mission-driven research and practical exercises like this are a part of that exercise. To date, as the Minister said, uh, half a billion dollars has been committed to innovation in Queensland. As, uh, we are leading the country in terms of a state-based effort to harness ideas and turn them into action. This is genuinely a whole of government exercise and critically built with stakeholders, built with collaboration. So we've obviously been delivering jobs, we've obviously been leveraging private sector investment, uh, we've been dramatically increasing our start-up growth, but what we're seeing is a real potential that people with ideas can turn them into action that matters in Queensland. So in terms of the SBIR program, I just want to give you a little bit of background on that program. It is modelled on best practice internationally. So similar programs have been successfully run in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And, you know, as part of Advanced Queensland, we've shamelessly borrowed that because it works. Um, clearly, it is about funding solutions to complex challenges for which there is not an obvious solution. And the Coral Abundance Challenge is one of those, and as I say, being supported by the Australian Government as well. So applicants can apply for a share of up to $1 million for a feasibility stage and then a further $1 million at the proof of concept stage. I do want to say it is open to the challenge owners, the participating departments, to take more than one team or, or group through uh, these stages. And that will depend upon the quality of the ideas that are presented. In terms of our time, time frames, we want to make, sh make sure that it's clear to everyone involved that this is a rigorous and competitive process. It is a process that will engage experts to uh, look at the solutions that are being provided. We do want to move through. We do want to make the right decision. We also want to give you sufficient certainty about how we're going to engage so that you can put together the, the bids that are the best ones to help the reef. So, as you know, applications have opened and we are here at the Information Exchange Day today. This day is a fantastic opportunity for you to hear directly from the challenge owners, the sponsors of this challenge, and to ask questions of them. 
I really urge you to take advantage of that opportunity. It's worked very well with other challenges in terms of both you understanding what, what's really uh, being asked of, but also for the challenge owners to understand what, you've, what your issues are and just so that we've got that shared understanding. We will uh, look to shortlist and undertake a solution presentation day in mid to late April. That is where teams will effectively pitch their ideas to the expert panel. There'll be an opportunity to engage and ask questions uh, and then a decision will be made. We hope to advise uh, successful teams in May and June and commence the feasibility stage shortly thereafter. The feasibility stage will be for up to six months. At the end of that point, a uh, decision will be made whether to proceed to proof of concept. Uh, and we would hope that from January, February, we would be on a proof of concept stage for up to 12 months. The aim is to get the best ideas, to test them and develop them. What I would say, and critically for this uh, program, is you, the innovator, will own any IP created as a result of your participation in this challenge. It's not our goal to ha take your ideas uh, from you, but equally, this is a procurement process. If at the end of the day, the idea that you put up is something that both governments wish to procure, they can do so, safe in the knowledge that has been through this process. But as I say, you can then take the IP that you've generated and use it in other ways uh, to benefit other, uh, other natural resources that are threatened or applied in different ways. So the aim of the game is we will this is an R&D process. We will support you in developing your ideas. We're not seeking to own them. But at the end of the day, if they work, we are seeking to buy them. So collaboration and networking, as I said, is absolutely critical for uh, innovation and as a part of this process. We want to open up to you the opportunity to network with one another and to collaborate with one another. Through our Advanced Queensland website, you can actually put up some details about what you're doing, what you're interested are, if you're seeking any collaborators, and that will be fully visible. So there's an opportunity for you then to connect uh, with potential partners. As I say, many uh, uh, teams that bid through the SBIR process are a combination of a number of sets of expertise, particularly given the complexity of the challenges that we're facing. And of course, there is an opportunity after today to do some networking with the people here. One thing I would observe is that because we may ha well have international teams, that's another great uh, opportunity for those watching who are in other countries around the world to also understand who might be here on the ground in Queensland and Australia that they could partner with. In terms of the submission process, so our applications close at 2pm Australian Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday the 6th of March. And so you can do that through the website, it's, it's easy to do. Um, and as I say, we will form an evaluation panel uh, from both the Commonwealth and the state uh, to assess this. And the uh, members of that panel will be subject matter experts. So you can expect that if you get through to a solution presentation day, you are pitching to people who are in, in and of themselves have a deep understanding of the issues we face. And so that will be a really quality engagement and they will be able to assess uh, the nature of your proposal. So what I would say is in terms of innovation and in terms of the Great Barrier Reef, as the Minister indicated, there's a lot that's been done, but clearly there's a lot more to do. In the case of Queensland, if I can, um, some of you uh, are probably too young to remember David Bowie. Actually, no, no, you remember him. No, no, that's fine. Uh, David Bowie has a great quote. Uh, he said that the future belongs to those who can see it coming. And in Queensland, through what we're doing in innovation, through what we're doing with the Great Barrier Reef, we can see it coming. And we are keen to work with you to deliver a, substanti a substantial benefit to the Great Barrier Reef. I'd like to uh, welcome my colleague, Alyssa Nichols, uh, who is Executive Director of the Office of the Great Barrier Reef in the Department of Environment Science. And as Alyssa said to me before, she is the challenge owner. So <laughs> good luck with that, Alyssa. Uh, <laughs> and I'll invite Alyssa to come up. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming along today. Uh, it's really exciting to see such a range of people in the room and people online for this challenge. Um, it's very close to our hearts in the office of the Great Barrier Reef. So my role today is to give you a bit of uh, a scope of what the problem is that we're facing. And I know some of you in the room will probably know it better than me because I see some real um, experts across um, the field here. But also um, I'll be facilitating the question and answer session which will commence straight after my part of the presentation. 
So the Great Barrier Reef, it's enormous, 344,000 square kilometres. And um, some of you will have seen the comparisons uh, that it's the same size as Italy, it's the same size as Japan, Mexico, those sort of countries. So that's the kind of size that we're dealing with here. It is a World Heritage property and it's one of the best known World Heritage properties and it gets international media all the time. The reef contains the greatest species diversity of any World Heritage area on Earth and you can see some of the um, figures there, are, you know, 56% of the world's hard coral species, 33% of the world's soft coral species. I think um, the number's over 600 actual species of corals on, um, in the reef. Some reefs in the world only have 5 to 20 species of corals to give you an uh, um, example of the kind of diversity we've got here on the Great Barrier Reef. It's also really important to Queensland and Australia economically. Um, recent estimates suggest that uh, the reef is generating around $6 billion a year to the Australian economy and over 69,000 jobs. Uh, so this is a really important environment for us environmentally and economically and also socially as the minister outlined with our traditional owners but also the um, users of the reef generally along there recreational fishers people who go snorkeling people who don't live near the reef also have an identity and connection to the reef in Australia it's actually part of Australia's identity the Great Barrier Reef so it's very important in lots of different ways the Queensland and Australian governments have a plan for how we're going to improve the health of the reef while it's under stress. It's the Reef 2050 Long-Term Sustainability Plan. It's a framework, it's an overarching framework, but there's a lot of actions in there that the governments have committed to taking under the next five years. So the vision of the plan is to ensure the Great Barrier Reef continues to improve on its outstanding universal value, so that's the World Heritage um, uh, term, every decade between now and 2050 to be a natural wonder for each successive generation to come. Now that's an ambitious vision, particularly with the kind of back-to-back -back bleaching events we've seen in recent times. Both governments invest millions of dollars each year um, through the plan in protecting biodiversity, managing ecosystem health and improving water quality from land-based runoff. What we're really trying to do here is develop ecosystem resilience in the face of the variable and changing climate. So we need the reef to maintain its resilience as a natural system and that's been one of the features of the reef always that it's always been buffered by cyclones it's always had um, flood impacts from um, the land but it's always been resilient to those impacts it suffers it comes back so what we need is to maintain that resilience in the system because what we're seeing now is more and more impacts more regularly now this, um, my team put this in, uh, hopefully not to scare you. <laughs> it's a list of all the different legislation that can apply around the Great Barrier Reef. It's more an indication that any solutions that you come up with may need some permits to undertake tests in the Great Barrier Reef itself. Now, not all of those will be relevant to what you're doing. In fact, there's actually only a handful that are directly relevant. I think most obvious one will be the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act and there's quite a significant permitting system under that. So be aware of that. Do your research about what permits you might require. As part of this challenge and with our partners in Gabrumpa and um, DOEE, we'll be trying to make that process as easy as possible, but it is a legislative process. We do have regulatory requirements that we have to meet. Uh, there is a possibility for research permits and that sort of thing, but just be aware that this isn't a blank canvas in terms of what you might be able to do out there. So the big picture of the threats, climate change remains the greatest threat to the long-term survival of the reef. We need a global response in order to make the necessary reductions in carbon emissions. Australia and Queensland can do its bit, but we need the whole world to be um, acting in concert for this. As I've already said, we need to make the reef more resilient so that it's got every chance of surviving well into the future while the carbon emissions are adequately addressed globally. And that's what this challenge is about. It's about finding ways for the reef to be more resilient, to regrow its corals more quickly, to in a greater expanse, that sort of thing. So we really need a step change that'll supplement the good work that's already being done and will address those immediate needs facing the reef. Some of the key issues, um, coral cover decline in the northern Great Barrier Reef is unprecedented due to the mortality from severe cyclones, the crown of thorns starfish outbreak and the severe bleaching events of 2016 and 
2017 really, um, but that 2016 was in the far north was by far the worst. So coral bleaching occurs and, uh, you know, I've got great experts here who can say this, but effectively when corals are stressed and in this circumstance by unusually warm temperatures, what corals will do, corals are a symbiotic relationship between the polyp, the little animal, and uh, algae called zooxanthellae that live inside the coral. And that's the thing that provides coral with the colour. And most notably, it provides um, coral with a food source. So it does photosynthesis and it brings food into the um, coral. So when corals get stressed, they spit out their little algae and that's when they go into that phosphorescent fluorescent stage and into pure white. That is not a dead coral. So corals can recover from that state if the stress is removed and the algae can repopulate the coral. The corals will still be stressed, it's like having a bad flu, but they can recover. If the stresses aren't removed, what will happen over time is that the corals will starve. Also warming can be significantly warm enough that it can just kill the corals outright and we did see some of that happening during the last two events. So you can see the figures there. There's an estimated 29% um, of shallow water corals were lost in 2016 as a result of the bleaching. So that's a very significant amount. Um, the full assessments haven't come in yet for 2017, but there are figures out there suggesting up to 50% lost. So our challenge is to quickly restore ecological functions provided by the Great Barrier Reef through cost-effective methods which protect corals exposed to extreme temperatures and to encourage the recovery of damaged corals after heat wave and storm conditions. So we're really looking for challenges that develop solutions that support the protection, regeneration and recovery of coral populations on the reef. Now there's lots of things out there that can do that, but the scale is usually so small and so localised that it really is like a drop in the bucket for something the size of the Great Barrier Reef. And that's one of the things that we're really interested in as part of this challenge. Can people come up with an idea to be able to do these things at scale at a cost effective way? So you will have read this in the challenge statement, but I'll reiterate it here today. So the first part of the challenge, addressing the impacts of coral bleaching. So that might be reducing the exposure of coral to physical stresses that cause bleaching, say cooling the water or something like that. Um, building the resilience of corals to allow them to bounce back more quickly after a bleaching event. The second part of the challenge, we're looking at enhancing coral recruitment. So an example might be um, looking at how we can boost the success of coral larvae and transplant and or transplanted and cultivated corals settling and surviving. So there is already techniques to do that, but how do we make them um, more viable, more effective? Uh, we are looking at ways to promote the settlement of coral larvae. So um, I think probably most of you know that um, most corals spawn in a um, single event every year or sometimes two events every year. So are there ways that we can get those corals to settle and um, make new baby corals? Uh, and the other thing is stabilising dead coral rubble um, generated by recent um, bleaching or cyclone impacts. So one of the things, corals are very fussy about where they settle. Um, if the substrate is moving too much, they won't necessarily settle and grow there. So similarly, if the substrate is covered with algae, they won't settle and grow there. So they, they want to look for somewhere that gives them the best chance to survive. So that part of um, the ideas that we might be looking for is how can we... I guess, make a pleasant home for the baby corals so that they'll want to settle there. That's my technical way of putting it. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. <laughs> so this has already been gone through by um, uh, Paul earlier. So one thing that he didn't mention, so we've got the feasibility stage and the proof of concept stage. On reef trials are to occur as part of it and that's where that permitting comes into so do do pay attention to that. Um, successful solutions as we've also said may be procured by the government in an expanded application process and and the beauty of this process is that it's a procurement process so if at the end of the day the governments want to invest in it we've already been through that um, rigour and probity to be able to um, quickly procure some of those solutions. And yes, as we've already said, applications close 6th of March at 2pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. So best of luck. And where we're going to go from now is to um, our question and answer session. So can I ask our panellists to come up? 
and I'll introduce you all. <laughs> Wherever you like. <laughs> Okay, so we have Will Howard here from the Department of Environment and Energy. We've got Professor Ove Hogelberg from um, University of Queensland Global Change Institute. You've probably all seen him on David Attenborough's Great Barrier <laughs> Reef special. Uh, we have, who have we got next in the row? Danielle Stewart um, from Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. We've got um, Paulina Kanyuska from my team, Office of the Great Barrier Reef and Department of Environment and Science. We've got um, Kirsten Dobbs from Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, and I'm sorry, we've got to ring in, but I've forgotten your name. I didn't uh, Marinda Nash. From Marinda Department. Nash from, <laughs> from Department of Environment. So we're going to try and answer all the questions in the allotted um, time slot, and there's people um, with roving mics around the room. We also have people on Skype here today, and so if there's questions coming through there, which um, you can write in, my team will... Um, wave a hand at me and I'll insert those questions at the um, various correct times during the session. Uh, I, I think there's some info on there. Is that the last slide, Ben? No, yeah. Excellent. So, who's got the first question? <laughs> so, I'll just get the mic just so the people on the Skype link can hear you. I was wondering if the study of uh, the use of bisulfate on the reef to kill the thought crown of thorns has been looked at a little bit more because I think that, in my view, the bisulfate is bleach and it's probably contributing to the problem of bleaching on the reef. And I'd like to ask the professor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no place to run. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a really uh, interesting point. So um, uh, this comes from the fact that when you uh, are trying to control crown of thorns, one of the most effective ways is to have a syringe and to inject starfish uh, and then they die soon afterwards. The amount of that biosulfate is pretty small relative to the overall problem, say, of bleaching. So when we see bleaching, we see it across, as was just demonstrated the last couple of years, 50% of the reef. And... Uh, so that's probably pretty hard to argue that that's due to the injection of the starfish. But in any of those solutions, it's going to be really important not to have unintended consequences. You invent something great and you protect coral, but somehow you kill fish. That, you know, so it's going to be that integrated solution. So well done. Down here? Is it Mike coming to you? Uh, good day, Daniel Harrison, uh, Sydney Institute of Marine Science. Um, just with respect to that, I guess um, I'm wondering, you know, these two phases for the innovation challenge that you have here, I think it's unreasonable to expect many of these ideas to be developed enough for procurement after just the second stage with the kind of amount of dollars that you're talking about when it's so important to consider what Ove's talking about, that all the potential you know, unintended consequences, the full environmental repercussions of many of these ideas. So I just wondered what your thoughts are on, you know, I, I think that there's going to have to be a bit more of a gap between procurement and the end of this challenge. Oh, look, and there, and there may well be, and we'll have to um, play that by ear, but um, this, this is the second of these challenges that I've run. And um, in that particular challenge, the previous one I ran, we actually had people who came from outside the field who actually had ideas that could be converted really quite quickly that nobody knew about who were inside the field. So that's one of the fascinating things about this style of challenge. And those ones will potentially be able to go to solution really quite quickly. Whereas there might be other things that are really fantastic ideas that are far more back in the R&D stage that we have to do more work on. And the whole purpose of this style of process is to flush out things from all over the place in another field entirely that might have a great application or be able to be added on to some other R&D work that somebody in the field is doing so that we can maybe get to a solution more quickly. So do, do um, think about that in that networking kind of context that Paul talked about. Oh, sorry, there's someone up the back, I think, first. 
And then um, uh, just Jenny a question in the same vein, just on timing. Um, we're, we're looking at a six-month kind of first first phase. Um, if if you want anything to do with coral settlement or, or corals, you've only got one shot, and you're outside of that window with that six months because you'll be right at the end of it. Yeah. Um, how flexible is that timing, I guess, in terms of if it's the right solution, are you prepared to push it back? Yeah, oh, and we, we may well be, and um, we've, again, given um, extensions in other challenges before. So, yeah, if there's a challenge that's particularly around that, that's got to be trialled, but it might be trialled in the lab or there's there's ways around that um, uh, as well. So it, it will depend, cause, because this is such an open... Um, set of issues that we're talking about. There's so many different things. So we're going to have to play it a little bit by ear as um, we go along. It's a little different to the challenges we've run in the past that have been a little bit tighter. So this one down here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, David Burt, Director of UQ Genomics. Uh, I respond to the uh, previous comments we had there. Uh, I consider myself as somebody coming from outside this area. Uh, I can see we can apply directly ideas from animal breeding, crop breeding, and genomics, and apply that to identifying, selecting uh, coral ecosystems effectively, the coral relationships that uh, are adapted to currently mm -hmm. to s higher temperatures. But your comments in the in the presentation here, it, it needs to be sustainable, so. It's not going to stop this year. Uh, every year, things will change, and we need to uh, keep adapting to that. So I think some of the solutions need to be a, able to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. My kind of concern slightly is um, it's a very short time scale, six months a year. Um, yeah. But uh, I think it's very exciting if we can bring several, pe several groups together to actually think, you know, within, within a year, they come up with maybe not the solution but uh, some reasonable ideas and directions that then can be followed on. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, some comments there, but what are your views for carrying on some of these ideas? Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. say, for example, in, within a year we have a promising solution. What happens next? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I guess we, we haven't really thought that far ahead, um, which is probably showing from my answers here. But that's something that we're going to have to have a look at. There is a lot of money that the governments have put up at the moment um, for these things. So if there's something that's very promising, either the Australian government or the Queensland government or the governments in partnership may be looking to invest in that. There's been some recent announcements about research and development. There's a lot of interest here. So we have what we call an adaptive management program for the reef, for the reef funding, for all of that. So we, we are adaptive, we are flexible, and we will be looking at promising solutions. And if there's something that needs else to be done, we will be considering that. Is there any comment? Yeah. I was just going to make a comment about mm -hmm. um, the complexity of the solutions. Um, some of these may be really simple. And I'll give you just one example of an innovation uh, which I was um, not, in, not involved in, but I was in a program where it happened. And it was basically, how can you grow corals really cheaply? Because at the moment, it costs a lot of money. It's like 5 to $10 to do per coral colony. And if you try to do this at scale, it's really difficult. Israeli and Filipino researchers got together and invented something called the rope nursery, where they basically took rope, undid the strands of the rope, poked little bits of coral in, and coral grows like from you know, cuttings in the garden. It's the same thing with corals. You just break off a little bit and put it in there. They put these ropes out at sea, came back two years later, and there was a coral rope, which they then attached to the bottom of the sea. And they brought down the cost of growing corals uh, in this way by probably tenfold. And, and so this is where I think the innovations will come. It, it may not be molecular biology selecting a heat-tolerant coral that, you know, because that may be too far into the future in terms of the research. But on the other hand, it could be as simple as a rope nursery or some innovation like that. And what's really wonderful about the coral business is that there's a whole series of people that grow corals in captivity. I once went to a, a coral show in the middle of North America where there was sort of thousands of people growing corals. So there's a whole area, there's a tinkerer's base here 
And who grows corals at home? Anybody? Oh, we've got <laughs> some here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but to me, that's where I think some of these really clever ideas will come because it won't, won't be the molecular biologist necessarily uh, saying that this is the way to go. It may be the tinkerer plus the other expert that goes, hey, we can do this. This could go viral. <laughs> Sorry. I've actually got another question that. coming through, so, but, yeah, just, very, just very, quickly. Very, very it, it is a complicated, complex uh, problem. Mm. It does require many uh, people getting around the table, not a geneticist, not an ecologist, actually, probably, t I don't know, 10 people from yep. different disciplines. Yep. We need to grow these things. We need to identify various types, a whole bunch of things. So, like I said, like my comment earlier and the other guy here, yeah. It's really hot, complicated, and uh, I think promise and solutions that integrate these things. Integration is the key, mm -hmm. and within a year will come up, uh, and then the, the solution will come. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. We've got someone coming on from online. Yep, this is from the live stream. So we've got two questions from Mark Sherat. Um, the first question he would like to ask is for the marine biologists on the panel. Um, what impact would a water cooling device have on other wildlife on the reef? That's a good question. Um, there have been some suggestions about technologies to increase the circulation of water from deeper layers in the ocean up to the surface. And there has been a, a concentration on, um, on the benefits for the shallow water corals as you cool those temperatures. But of course, you're exchanging the water on the surface by pumping warm water down deep and so we actually don't know what the effect of having warmer water on corals at depth. So there's a whole range of different issues here. Um, we don't know what the noise factor of whirring motors might be for local, you know, cetaceans. Uh, you know, there's a whole series of things that have to be checked out and I think that's one of the reasons why um, this has to be a transdisciplinary exercise, as was mentioned here. Uh, that it has to involve all the perspectives so we don't go off on something and create these great whirring waterfalls that then kill Nemo and the reef <coughs> with it. Uh, so I think it is really important. But, but I think that's an important question to do with those circulation things is what's the effect on other parts of the system? Is there any other comment? Add, add to that. I've, so one of the things to consider when you're putting these um, uh, solutions in along those lines is not to shy away from the potential negative impacts. Uh, and as Kirsten and I, our roles are involved in assessing impact assessment. So if your project has to come through for a permit or uh, an environmental assessment in the federal department, we would be looking for information on the potential negative impacts and then particularly what you've got in place or considering how to um, avoid, mitigate those those impacts and uh, and also so monitor them. So that's so it's important to identify potential negative impacts uh, and not to shy away from them because they may well have to be assessed by a government department and then to allow time for that. And, and I also think it's it's important to think about scale and and the sensitivity of the environment you're actually dealing with and what those potential impacts are. Some values can respond better to adverse impacts than others, you know, and I think that's why the, the, the idea of feasibility, proof of concept, start small, get some, gather some information that can help support or otherwise a case and, and move forward from there. Um, you know, I've heard timeframes mentioned here, you know, getting results and having a solution, having a Great Barrier Reef back where we want it to be is going to take a lot of time and probably take a lot of different solutions operating at different scales. And so scalability is very important because obviously we have a very large ecosystem here, but if we can get the proof of concepts happening at a, at a smaller scale and understand the impacts, whether it's, you know, altering circulation patterns or growing out, um, you know, almost monocultures of coral, we need to better understand what that actually looks like and actually identifying what is the outcome? Is it okay to just have a monoculture on a reef because at least you have coral there? What's, what's the flow on effects of that? Thank you. And there was another one. There was another question. So this is from Mark Sherat as well. Has the bio rock been experimented with on the Great Barrier Reef yet? 
And if yes, what were its effects? Does anyone right. know about BioRock? Yeah, I, I can probably yeah. respond to that. Um, there, there are some researchers beginning to look at this. Um, it is very early days. Do you we, want to say what it is for the other people in the room? Okay, so in, in my very non-technical layman's terms, it's trying um, putting in some metal wire cages essentially and electrifying them to get the coral to grow faster. Is that more or less? Hopefully, I'm looking at coral expert down there. <laughs> um, so this is being field trialed right now um, at, at a location. We've only just granted a permit for it, so it's very early days. We don't have results back. But again, as part of the permitting process, we do like to get results back and hear how things are going so we can better inform our processes going forward. OK. Other questions over here? Hi, you, you talked about scale and you know that certain things work currently at smaller scale and you're looking to be able to kind of deal with those at a kind of much larger scale. Have you got a definition around what is sort of small scale and what, what you're looking to kind of achieve as an outcome? Oh, we haven't really defined it that specifically. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts. I mean, individual reefs you can see occur on scales of a few hundred meters, but all the processes that we're concerned with experimenting on occur right across the scales. Um, obviously, ultimately, we want something that would scale to something like the scale of the Great Barrier Reef, but obviously, we have to start somewhere. So, you know, so I think most of the proposals that people have been talking about have been at that kind of reef scale, which is tens to hundreds of meters. And just a follow-up yeah. question, is there any specific kind of areas within the, the marine park that is within Kirsten's area, which is about, well, is there any areas that, that are um, opportunities to kind of target uh, and pilot and trial things? And is there any areas that are probably no-go zones that, that can't be kind of, you know, sort of looked at? <laughs> Because I think that kind of comes back to the logistics and the business model that sits behind yeah, sure. it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and um, we certainly have one thing, um, and I appreciate Alyssa's presentation saying, think early about your permitting requirements. And the main message we try and give to people is engage early with us. Give us a sense of what you're proposing to do. We can then further identify if there are no-go areas, if there are constraints. Um, Mr. Chrissy, you asked whether there are locations that are better than others. And I think that really depends on what you're trying to, to prove with the proof of concept or with the study. Um, it does get down at that individual research project level. Um, with respect to, to go or no go, I mean, our act sets out certain things that are absolutely prohibited. So if mining is part of your solution, um, you're going to need to look elsewhere. That's not going <laughs> not gonna to fly with us. Um, and it really comes down to what people want to do and where and being able to justify against the various zone types that we have. Um, I, I could probably fill in the rest of your morning about the, the legislation, the policy, and the regulatory environment that, that you may be operating in. But what I encourage people is to do a little bit of homework on our website. We have a lot of information there. But also just letting people know we work, we have a joint permit system with the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, so we try and cover from high water out in the Great Barrier Reef. So that's this one application, one assessment, one permit, two signature type process. We also have a joined up process with the Department of the Environment and Energy. If something does need to be referred under the, the national legislation and also needs the marine park permit, we have a joined up process there. So, you know, we, we are trying to streamline. We also work closely with our fisheries colleagues in the Queensland government because when you're talking coral, that's something that they also have an interest in and have a rules and regulations around it. Mm. Well, I think it's fair to say that um, the inventors should push the government as far as possible. Mm. So pursue your idea mm. and they're going to work out how you're going to implement it. Is that fair enough? Or I put you yeah, too much well, in the spotlight? But I think to, that's to important. That, but, uh, yeah, I know. I mean, obviously going around shooting things <laughs> or mining uh, won't be... But, but, I think, but, I but, think but, it, yeah. but I think that's going to be really important in this process that um, it's, it's sort of pushing things to the point mm -hmm. and then asking for how it can be done. Uh, because we may 
limit ourselves ultimately yep. and say, well, yeah. well, there's a rule there, and yeah. you know. So we need to sort of try to get out, get out of the box, and have the government try to stop us. We can always find ways of doing <laughs> things, but we all we, there's a whole swag of people mm. we have to consult to mm. be able to do that, and that can sometimes not be done at the eleventh hour, which yeah. is when some of these things come to our attention. So yeah, that's true. we can make yeah. almost anything happen if we know about it early enough to be able to yeah. put things in place. Yeah. So um, I manage the coral industry, so yeah. the Queensland coral fishery, mm. and those guys would have to be consulted for things that happen in sure. an official fishery that no, happens absolutely. on the reef. No, absolutely. I, so I was just saying the sort of principle here is that we should really oh, absolutely. sort of push the limits as much as we can and yeah. then... We've never uh, played you guys in this space before. So. That's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and absolutely. You, you, know, you may make things happen that may not have happened before yep. because of the... The idea being really sure. compelling. That's right, and I think that's a really important point. And you know, the Great Barrier Reef's always been an area where that's had fairly minimal intervention in this kind of way. So mm -hmm. we're learning as well. Uh, but we are with, and you know, notwithstanding the comments about permitting, I think the important thing is if you've got an idea, start talking early so that you can mm -hmm. get a sense of what it is. I think that's the biggest message to take home. Um, don't take any of those comments as barriers to you being able to test your idea, I think mm -hmm. is, is what I'd like to say. And, and if I can just add one, one more component to that. Um, the Minister highlighted this morning, there are a whole range of people who use the Great Barrier Reef. There's, you know, existing site dedicated tourism operators, you know, recreational users, commercial fishers. And so having early communication with the people who may be using the area that you want to do some trial trialing at is really important to get, get them on board. One thing that is probably consistent across all government regulations and permits is the ability for people to seek a reconsideration of, of a decision or potentially tie it up in the court. We don't want that. And so we're very keen that people get out and talk with the other users of the area. You might find partnerships, yep. integration, collaborations that could actually assist with some of the work that you, you're desiring to do. And that, that's also very important. Those users could be your partners. So the tourism industry, for example, are very active in this space and they're already partnering in some other research trials. So think about who might be you know, partners for you. They're out there every day with boats. That could be a way to deal with the logistics of your solution. Particularly for those that, sorry, just while I think of it, yeah. particularly for those that are talking about um, innovative, innovations that are dealing with in growing of corals and taking corals and things like that and putting them back in. There is a whole swag of people that already do this. So commercial operators do this mm. every day. They, mm. they know this business better than anybody. Don't, because they um, operate in the reef in a different way to you, don't discard what they know. And they are always looking for collaboration opportunities with other people. And this type of thing for them, they're very responsible. They take their industry very seriously. So if that's something you're thinking about, I would be definitely approaching mm. industry mm. or finding out ways to approach industry to just say, this is our idea, help us with it. OK, I've got a question here. I wondered when you're actually um, showing your your um, idea, is it in this venue or like do you get to have a place to show something big or is it just yeah, like a little... Yeah, it, it won't be in this venue because um, it's, uh, it's like a little, the little panel, the decision making panel with each person comes in oh, okay. by themselves. So, so you we'll, don't we'll... have the opportunity to show a video or Oh anything? yeah, yeah. You'll you'll have yeah. um, access to video and PowerPoint. You'll be able to bring in show and tell if you want, all of that sort of yeah. thing. So you know like the other one that I did, um, it was a water quality sensor one. So people were bringing in big boxes, wheeling in boxes to show us their bits. <laughs> so it's it's um, a very flexible process. So this this is really just because a whole bunch of people come in together. We need yeah. a big venue. And how long be in this do you venue. get to show for that? Um, I can't remember Reese. Here. Hi, Katie Chartrand from Tropwater, James Cocchini. My question is more around how you see this particular proposal or solution um, sort of integrating into the other projects that are underway and programs such as RAP, which is Ames and other partners are working on downstairs, whether both at the evaluation stage for these projects to go forward and sort of in the development and leveraging or going forward into the future, how that will integrate. Um, I guess where the, and, and this is 
thing about the Great Barrier Reef, um, there's always lots of other things going on. Uh, and that's part of this process, I guess, is for people to think about that if they are aware of things, how they might integrate. Uh, but it also might be something that um, we and our subject matter experts identify and, um, you know, want to uh, match up at some sort of point. Uh, yeah, it's um, not, never straightforward <laughs> when it comes to uh, those sort of different things going on. Is there any comments anyone wants to make on that? Oh yeah, so Craig, this is Craig Moore from Department of Environment. He's a comment. Canberra, Department of Environment. Um, so I guess in response, um, we in the, especially in the uh, Commonwealth Environment Department are liaising and talking with our counterparts in Ames and CSIRO who are doing the uh, R&D program, as well as other sort of Commonwealth entities who play in this space. So we're very aware of you know, the, the results and the outcomes that might flow from our innovation challenge as well as all of that work. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, we're, we're making sure that, at least from our sort of Commonwealth end, we're trying to make sure that that's all linked up and we're aware of what they're doing and making sure that, you know, as, as things progress, that where there's opportunities or crossovers or that sort of stuff. Thank you. <coughs> Another question in the middle? Uh, how important is it for you to keep, say, one whole reef going for tourism operators, obviously into the future in the next 10 years and it's predicted to get worse, blah, blah, blah. Um, how important would it be to look at things rather than the entire reef, more like one entire, I guess, reef system where, you know, you've got the grazing zones of the fish moving from reef to reef? Would that be something that you guys would consider, looking after like yep. one complete reef section yep. as or lagoon as opposed to the entire reef, the Great Barrier Reef as a whole? We're, we're not expecting these solutions for you to address the entire reef. That's just too big <laughs> at once. But yeah, entire reef system. I'm just going to comment that the, there's, so much, there's a lot of variability across these reefs as sure. it is. And so, so I, I think already the, the system presents itself uh, on those scales in any yep. case. So I think it's this... There's no ruling out that some of the solutions might be at reef scale, and, and that certainly is important. Um, well, ultimately, we want to preserve the resilience of the reef at, at its entire scale, but, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but you have to start somewhere, and, and that variability exists already, and that may present, uh, that may present some opportunities right. that we can exploit. Yeah, cheers. Did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah and I, I think the idea of... of um, locations that are, let's say there was a clever mechanism to, to uh, increase the coral abundance on particular points, if they were in key areas, uh, they might play a very important role in recovery as we start to stabilise the climate again. Um, so for me, I think that's really important. And, and that question about the tour operator and a patch of reef, and that can often be really important. Um, if you look at Quicksilver, which is a company that takes people out to the reef and they have platforms on the edge of the reef, and you look at the millions of dollars that they actually earn from a fairly small patch of coral, um, maintaining the health of that coral becomes really quite economically important because of that intense activity. And so I, I, I think there's very much room for understanding smaller patches that then maybe help recovery or have particular value to our businesses here in Queensland. Yeah, I, th and I think um, that's actually a really important point that our independent expert panel that advises us under Reef 2050 has made repeatedly, which Ove is actually a part of, um, that there are different reasons that we need to look at which reefs we need to target and they might be for tourism reasons they might be for ecological reasons and there's actually quite a mix of things and we can't just pick one or the other necessarily so um, yeah your particular idea might target a particular type of a reef that's of value for a particular reason but yeah there's no sort of it's not like only go for the tourism reefs because that's what we care about this that's definitely not the message we want to give there's a question over here and so most of the solutions address problems like uh, climate change or uh, coral reproduction, but um, what's the perceived um, importance for addressing other stressors like uh, sedimentation or uh, erosion from agriculture or um, 
um, fertilizer runoff? Yeah, so that the water quality is um, a big issue that we're certainly investing a lot in, in across both the Australian and Queensland governments. This particular challenge is not targeted at that. It's more targeted on that marine side rather than the catchment side issues. Um, however, if you do have great ideas about that, I encourage you to come and talk to us outside of this challenge context because we're always looking for innovations in that space too. Over here. Um, if we can just go back on permits for a second. Uh, if, if we're out trailblazing your refex solution for you, can we park at the initial stage all the permit questions until the proof of concept? Is that possible? I don't think our legislation actually allows us to do that. Um, but there is, as I said, um, certainly for good one, when you want to, might want to talk about this, Kirsten, is the um, uh, research permit in particular. Yeah, and I guess is is your concern about the permit uh, a time frame issue or is it a flexibility uh, not issue? Knowledge or? base. I, like we've only got 28 days. We don't have time to read 3,000 pages of legislation. So we might have a solution for you. How, how can you help us? Deal well, with the permit side. Well, and and I think that's what this mm. is all about. Is mm. is um, as I said before, a lot of them can be case specific. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I'm not sure the criteria for the application process um, and the legalities or otherwise. Notwithstanding Ove's comment about pushing government and push <laughs> the boundaries, um, I, I wouldn't worry about the the permit side 100% yet. Um, you know, I think it's more about where's the where's the concept, where's the idea. Possibly location. I don't know if location's a, a core criteria for the application process. So, if you have a concept, we can then probably work with um, whoever is going to be doing the feasibility and the proof of concepts to let's look for locations where we can make this happen as easily as possible. Uh, one of the Thank panel you. members is actually from the Gabrumpa permitting side too, so we will be thinking about that as as we think and and will be. As I said earlier, looking to help whoever we want to take through to fe feasibility to get what they need so that they can move as quickly as possible. Usually you're not getting into the water until towards the end of that feasibility stage, but, you know, it depends on what your solution is. But, uh, you know, we, we don't want the permits to be a block to us trialling innovative solutions here. Permits are easy to do as long as we know what you want to do. So if, if I get a proposal put in front of me, sometimes they're really half-baked and I don't know exactly what you need to do. If I know exactly what you need to do, and the same yeah. with Gabrumpa, then I know exactly what you need to get. It's just, and by that stage you'll have a fair idea of what you, you need yeah, to achieve. Sure. So that, that part's not difficult. I wouldn't worry about it holding up the process. Mm -hmm. It's just be considerate of the fact that you will need something to use tools or to be in a certain area or do things like that. That part's easy. Just add, add to that. The other thing is, in, uh, Kirsten's already said this, but really engage engage early. So uh, with, our, with our department, um, with people that pick up the phone early on and start talking to us and finding out what it is that, you might, that we might need, uh, what we do need and what we don't need, just so when you're going forward you can be thinking about that and... Uh, yeah, not worrying about stuff that might not actually be relevant to us. So I always encourage people, if you're thinking about a proposal, um, engage with us early so we can give you some early feedback um, so that you can get the, the information yeah, to us. Absolutely, don't start reading acts. Just, yeah, no, I don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah, that, that's this, our this job. It's not as easy as it is. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually our job. I was going to say, don't yeah. read don't the law. Don't read the fisheries act because you just, just don't. No, you, yeah, just don't. <laughs> You'll just be despondent. Yeah, just okay, uh, was there another question over this side? Nope, over here. Ah, oh, yes. Hello, uh, my name's John Edmondson from Wavelength Reef Cruises, so a tour operator. Um, we've been uh, thinking about this for quite a while since the bleaching in 2016 and um, have a few ideas, but I think um, a key thing is partnership between tourism and science, which is a bit of a disconnect at the moment. But the whole area really seems to suit open science or open source science. So how do you reconcile that with the intellectual property aspect of this? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Any thoughts? <laughs> I'd, yeah, I'm not I'll an do IP. the typical government response. We'll take that on notice and get back to you. <laughs> I think that's what we'll have to do. Um, at, at, so I can speak from experience of the previous challenge. Um, 
the IP was really different on different solutions that were presented to us. Some of them were quite technical solutions that had a lot of IP associated with it. Some of it was open source technology and the IP was actually in the methodology in which something was applied. So it was somebody's knowledge and being able to apply that. Others didn't really have a lot of IP associated. I think why we make such an emphasis of that IP question is really for people who are developing devices and technology and it might it might not be applicable for the particular solution that's being put forward so it's neither here nor there really it's more just saying the government's not going to try and steal your ideas that's what that you know line really meant so if someone's got a great idea and they want to give it to the government we're not going to go thanks and now we're going to flog it off for a heap of money so it's more that um, that's what that was there for we've got one coming through um, this is from Sadish Moses Living Architecture. Um, it's a bit of a different question. Might need a few people to respond to it, I guess. Um, a holistic perspective with complex layers involved. What about developing a comprehensive transdisciplinary strategy for the challenge? <laughs> Who wants to talk about complex transition? Wow. <laughs> Go. Of, uh, networking and uh, this, this type of event, and that's where we expect the solutions will, will come from. Sure. Well, that's actually a very good answer, and I, I, I think we do. Um, we would not be surprised to get multiple transdisciplinary applications. So we're not trying to develop a strategy, but um, you know, you guys might all get together mm. and um, work out a strategy for yourselves on that. I just would comment on that. Just to say that you may have a simple, there may be a relatively simple sort of reductionist solution that comes out of just something you can do in a fish tank. But remember to deploy it, if we are going to deploy it, it's going to be in a complex system. So I think that's the, that's the main thing to think about. And, and that's the consideration when it comes to actually applying some of these solutions. The reef is not a simple reductionist thing in a fish tank is it is of course a complex ecosystem so that's that's especially the point and it's not to rule anything out but that's especially the point where we have to start mm -hmm. thinking across disciplines is right. a so we've just got a follow-up to that no, one no, oh it's an, another question okay and then we've got one up the back i was just going to say that the the idea of wicked problems applies yeah here. it does um there are so many actors and so many processes and so many things that could not go the right way, that you have to look at it as a system, as was said. It's not just a fish tank with some corals and turn up yeah. or turn down the temperature. This is really complex. That, and, and that said, I think it's really important that, you know, this isn't about knocking, the, you know, we, we can't do anything because it's wicked. Actually, it just means that you have to have a particular multidisciplinary, multi-perspective approach. Another one coming Right, online. this is from um, Philip Carlin, three R consultants in Cairns. Um, I have developed a backwash tank to recycle swimming pool water to eliminate pool algicide from treatment water. I guess he's just asking how that might be able to be applied. Cool. Any thoughts? <laughs> I think this is where people who understand that technology need to, to collaborate with some people who have different different knowledge and, and see if there's a tweak to the system that, that could be useful. It's, you know, yeah. I, I personally, I, I have no knowledge about that, so I can't really um, comment how I could. Yeah, and I guess um, I suggest that um, you put your uh, details up on that networking mm -hmm. page that we talked about earlier and some people in this room or other people who are online might um, see how that might tie into something mm -hmm. that they're looking at doing. So um, do, do um, go back to that um, networking kind of idea to put, um, uh, yeah, reach out there. And this up here, lady's been waiting for a bit. Sorry, I want to bring up the um, idea of bisulfate again, and I'm wondering if it, uh, if this innovation is is uh, sort of set up so that the current management of the reef can be changed by the, this innovation, or are we just really not? It's not worth sort of going into looking at what the current management of the the reef and the crown of thorns on the reef is. Um, <coughs> You know, like you go to all the sort of uh, work to try and set up like photographers and videographers to try and map everything and what effects it's had and 
um, see if it has had an effect or um, if, you know, if maybe something that we haven't seen yet, you know, like, and it hasn't been sort of researched properly or the amount of bisulfates that's being imported to put on the reef and all those sort of things. And, and I just wondered if it's... If this innovation is set up so that we are able to change the government's management of their reef, yeah, ab than absolutely. That's that's the whole point of this innovation. Yeah. Uh, it's you know because we don't know the answers to everything, and we're constantly innovating. Even just with the crown of thorns starfish, it's just mm -hmm. been now approved that um, you can use vinegar injections rather than bisulfate. Mm -hmm. So um, you know there, there's actually we're always changing when the science comes al online. Um, if, I think yeah, everyone and, and I think what you're referring to is really important, and that is that we need to make decisions based on science and knowledge of the system. Um, and I think we've got a good track record here in Australia where uh, when things uh, appear to not be going in the right direction and there's really good evidence that there have been changes, you just think of the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef in 2004, and that really was quite legendary, it was science-based, it reorganised an entity the size of Italy, as we mm. all know. Um, probably not quite as difficult as reorganising <laughs> Italy. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was this process that, that drew on the, the excellent science and, and expert knowledge we have and make those changes. And so uh, this is very much about that. It's about, okay, if there is this clever idea or there's a problem that can be solved, uh, then with due process uh, through the various parts of the government apparatus and, and so on, this could be in place five years from now. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, I, I think that's the intention. Yeah. So can you speak into the mic, please? No one can hear you online. Yeah. Yeah. Show show the tourists who are actually going to the reef and spending a lot of money on the reef that it's not it's it's not a waste of time going there because mm. there are a lot of people who are working on the project of trying to fix the reef, and this is going to be one way that we're actually going to be zoning in on one reason why maybe the reef has been bleached, and that's because mm. of maybe we've. Uh, you know, use something on it that we probably could change in some way. So, mm. and that would encourage tourists to come to the reef. They mm. would w want to be part of that. Mm. They want to, you know, they want to be sort of part of the solution, which mm. is a great way of looking at um, promoting coming to the reef. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, what, what excites me about this type of policy is it is bringing everybody mm. together to look at this big problem. And there couldn't be a more important issue to Australia, I would argue. That's right. Uh, it is like, it, you, it, there are a lot of people who are depending on the reef. Hmm. Not just people who are actually tourists, oh. but people who've lived with the reef for their whole life. You know, they used to go there Ab when they were absolutely. a child. Absolutely, and, and when you ask people from overseas, what do they think of first uh, when they're, you know, I'm from Australia, they think of the Great Barrier Reef more than any other thing. Certainly That's more right. than Mountain and the Turnbull. reef was a beautiful place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry, everyone who works for the federal government. Okay. <laughs> Any um, other questions? Over here, Jen? Um, it's a bit of a show in the dark, but is there any information regarding the population of certain fish species, particularly blennies and gobies, on the Great Barrier Reef, or more specifically, individual reef systems? Ooh. Mm. Um, the Ames Long-Term Monitoring Program does record fish on reef when they're doing their coral surveys, exactly the species yeah. and everything, but that information is available on the Ames website. Yeah, they're mostly commercial species. Not, not the Ames surveys. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Ames surveys are actually the, the non-commercial yeah. species. So that they Australian focus Institute on. of Marine Science. Yeah. yeah. And there's two people, I think, that you might want to look up. Uh, one is Ian Tibbetts here at the University of Queensland who works on grazing fish coming out of the network. Uh, and the second one is um, uh, David Bellwood. Mm. Um, he's been really doing some very interesting stuff about the sort of 
uh, goby population and how it changes when you start to stress a reef and so on. And um, yeah, that's an interesting area to go in because these micrograzers could be really important in terms of controlling and reducing um, the competition between corals and algae by keeping the algae down. They're sort of like the invisible gardeners, right? So I, I can see where you're thinking. That's very clever. In the middle here. Um, in terms of intervening on high stress days, e.g. like changing water temperature and current creation and that sort of thing, how much data collection is there on larger than fish tank scale devices and all the rest of it? Because if mm. I have a solution in that area, which I think you'll definitely be interested in, but uh, is there any baseline modelling data? Have you ever done? Is there any interest in spending yeah. a lot of money on actually da oh, data do. logging the reef so that, you yeah. know, just as a baseline yeah. so that if you do go and put in a system, mm -hmm. there will be something to compare it against? Mm -hmm. Because I like a lot of scientists like the before and after shots. Yeah. If there's no before and you just got the after, then yeah, you've got nothing huge, to compare it to. Yeah, that's a huge yeah. challenge. It actually isn't mm -hmm nearly enough mm. um, there's yeah. it's 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 a growing area of focus for the science yeah. community but we need we need a lot more so um, are you talking about physical conditions in the ocean as in wh where you want to put your solution is that uh, you're heading? yeah well i guess just the whole if we did go ahead and i mean the time scales is we're talking 12 18 months from now mm -hmm. right then we put it in and then everyone goes, well, what's it comparing to? Because you don't have any previous oh, yeah, sure. data. So in the sense of if that was happening, what sort of uh, funding would there be to, yeah. before putting it on the reef, to at least have six months or a summer's worth of data, of data logging to see it all before it happens? Because I can see that mm -hmm. from, a, you know, from putting in systems like man intervention systems, sure. mm -hmm. it so would be very difficult without... The, the baseline. Yeah. So there's, there are some places to go. Um, Australian, well, Australian Institute of Marine Sciences and I think Gabrumpa have um, long-term temperature records across the reef. Um, the satellites flying um, uh, can actually detect the skin temperature of the ocean and, and that's also proven to a certain extent that you can get fairly accurate sort of one kilometre plus scales. And then I think the... The IMOS? Yeah, and then IMOS. IMOS, so there's these big boys that do not just temperature, but they yeah. do pH and they do also... And then the last one is something called e yeah. mm. which is yeah. a big collaboration between the foundation, yeah. the government, and the bureau. And that's where they're doing the sort of modelling. Um, mm. And it's based on a, on a very successful program done with the Murray-Darling River on, where they mapped water resources and they ended up with a model you could actually tweak and test notions. The same with this e-reefs for the Great Barrier Reef. It, it basically integrating knowledge from boats being tracked to temperature to, you know, river uh, sediments and so on. So that's probably an area, e-reefs, that you could go and have a look at and you'd probably find the sort of circumstances that you might want to, you might need for your proof of concept. Yeah, so if you Google e-reefs Great Barrier mm. Reef Foundation, you'll find the e-reefs website. So it's got hydrology um, mapping and real-time mapping and um, historical data sets as mm. well, and it's all um, available for um, people to have a look at. But that's a valid comment, though. If you're going to have a project mm. that's going to change something vastly and may have negative effects that you should have identified in your project, what is the baseline and take stock of what information is mm. there to compare what your effect, what your innovation is going, the effect your innovation is going to have. And if it is a data gap, then identify in the project, we want to um, implement this, however we can't compare it, we don't have anything to compare it to and that might be something that evokes some other work mm. that yeah. you need to be able to prove your concept. Well, it, might, it also might be part gaps. of your feasibility as yeah. well, so you might want to do some measuring as part of your feasibility. You yep. may be able to find settings that are both amenable to the solution you want to apply and have some baseline data already, which would yep. be ideal. Obviously, we, we always need more, uh, but, but yeah, there, there has been quite a bit of work done there. However, I mean, there's a lot of data that kicks around that no one ever picks up 
unfortunately we're not great at collaborating what data is already out there so something that may be worth putting up to ask people does anyone yeah. know if this is out there because you'd be surprised what it is that no one else mm. knows about even within the mm. industry or their circle of work mm. it sounds That's like point. that that you were asking the question whether we would be interested in looking at something that was just about the data but it seems so with that it's you would need to be this is about in improving outcomes so then partnering up with somebody that would need that baseline data so to to compare mm. to well, well more so would you be willing to push forward even if there what if there may be data gaps that you'll be picking up on the fly as the project goes along as opposed to having previous year baselines. Okay. Well, that would be part of the yeah. um, part of the assessment. Yeah. Yeah. assessment and obviously, process. mitigations put in place for the unknowns that possibly yeah. may have been. And, not, and really, um, this is not just about the the actual innovation um, assessment side. But then, if we're doing say an environmental assessment on it, where there's where there's gaps, we really look to how you have identified those those gaps. That's what I was saying before. Don't shy away from the the problem. So identifying the gaps what risks they may pose and then how you propose to uh, to deal with with those those gaps because it is an issue for marine science you know it's such a wide area to be measuring inevitably you've got you've got data gaps yep. so, yeah okay thank you um, other questions nothing oh yep one up the back just out, if you can wait for the mic, because we're recording the session. It's difficult without it. Hi there. Um, are there any particular areas the panel is hoping to see proposals in? All right. It's open, Put out it's your open. hopes and wishes. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone's hoping for a really left of field thing that we're like, yes, oh, we never yes. thought of that. Yeah. There's something with definitely that, that transdisciplinary, I think, approach, because that's usually when you find the best solutions. Fresh eyes, new yes, eyes always Yes, that's best. right. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess don't constrain your thinking. There are lots of ideas that people have, and until they actually sit down and explain to you, you, you initial, your initial reaction is, how could that even help? And then you start to see the, the full breadth of it. So don't, don't limit your creati crea crea creativity side on this you know, re really expand your thinking, you know, I think that's what everyone's hoping for is, you know, a solution, I, I guarantee there'll need to be more than one solution, but, you know, something that no one's ever thought of before, mm. except possibly yeah. yourselves. Yeah. Right. So, you know, when a coral spawns, it puts out millions of babies. If we could just have 1% of those survive more than they they did before, that could be quite transformational. Now, that's, there's no pathway there and that's the innovation, but to me that's what's exciting about this is that, and, and what I would really hope for, is that we learn some little trick where you just tweak it and suddenly you have just a shaving more survivorship and then suddenly you've tipped the balances. Um, that's my aspiration as a dreamer. That's good to know. And I think um, the other thing that we've talked about in um, the department is there are a lot of solutions out there, but they can only be implemented very expensively and on a small scale. And that's one of the things we're hoping this might attract is how do we, um, how can we do those on a bigger scale and, and more cheaply? And, and that sort of um, expertise might come from a really different field than um, who's been working. So that's another area that we're quite interested in. What what do we know works, but how do we make it um, scalable and mm. more cost effective? Question here. Oh, sorry, oh, have we got one here first? Yeah, hi. Uh, Mark Blavold from Undersea ROV. Just on that, is there scope in this project to, to develop a scalable, um, cost effective? delivery deployment observation um, mechanism that independent of an actual solution. So is, can we, could we put a proposal in, we've got an idea that we could get coverage over a number of reefs or even the whole reef, but without an actual solution attached? Uh, it probably wouldn't meet the challenge criteria, so do look at the challenge criteria again, but you might 
be able to partner with someone who's got a solution is looking for a way to, you know, that, that's actually, you know, the sort of thing we'd love to see um, collaborations on. We've I mean, just on that, if I get what you just said correctly, um, scanning the reef for regeneration points could be really important because then the authority can target those and protect them. So that requires really large um, AI, a whole bunch of different innovations that are needed to be able to do that. But that could easily then feed into a solution is how do you, you know, how do you identify and save those really important parts of the reef that are bouncing back against all odds? You throw things at them, cyclone, bleaching, you know, fishing pressure, and they still bounce back. I mean, there could be some real magic in that. Mm. And, and surveying, surveying and gathering data is a huge challenge. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, again, it's a big system, and it's not easy to send, you know, just divers out take, pic taking pictures or fly over. Uh, so, so it is a challenge. Uh, how it fits into this particular challenge, I, I don't know, but I don't. I think it's a, I think it's a really important area for development. One coming through online. Um, this is from this is from Guy. Um, are there any emerging contaminants of concern, or any worst case water quality sites on the reef that are affecting coral growth? That's, that information is uh, available in the latest scientific consensus yeah. statement mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Garumpa and Co have put, put together. That was just released a few months ago and there's some excellent information in that and um, some great mapping uh, with the various or their land-based pollutants that have been identified such as uh, fertiliser runoff and pesticides and sediments. So, so there is that information available. Yeah, so that, that's available on... Um, website reefplan.qld.gov.au, the 2017 scientific consensus statement. It's got a lot of detail and it adds, does have a section on emerging contaminants as well. I will say plastics is coming up though as a, an emerging yes. issue. It's not, it's not a massive issue for the Great Barrier Reef. Luckily, the amount of plastic on the reef is um, quite small, but you know, it's a world issue. So. Mm -hmm. Other questions? And we've still got about 15 minutes left for to gather as much info as possible and then we've got a networking session outside. Nope, we've dried the well. I don't one. <laughs> Sorry, earlier on you mentioned that if you had any thoughts on water quality was um, something that should be approached separately and we've touched on the subject of data mm. uh, collection a number of times and data sharing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, where's best to direct those types of innovations? Because... Um, probably to our office of the Great Barrier Reef website and the first, um, sorry, that if you go onto the website, you'll, uh, I can't remember the email address off the top of my head, it's office of GBR at, yeah, at des.qld.gov.au. If you send through um, a query that way, then uh, we'll get somebody to get back to you and uh, we'll keep in touch with our colleagues in Canberra about that. But we're always happy to talk about great water quality ideas too. Hi, I was wondering, trying to do this um, project and you wanted to sort of get quotes from say uh, photographers or um, you know uh, people who photograph the reef or you know people who research the reef as far as like statistics or like in the library or if you you know find out the costs of people who do all these things you know like do you actually have to have have that in the um, in the sort of the innovation uh, thing. Yes, you have to put um, an indicative budget into the um, your application to uh, say how much money you're seeking and um, what 
that might be expended on it. Like it doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but um, through this the feasibility um, decision process, what we work out is how many solutions we want to take forward, what they cost, how much money we've got. As we said, we've got a million dollars in that first round. So um, yeah, if you come in saying you don't know how much it's going to be, then that's not going to be helpful for us in um, so working you have to out. Go and find all those people. Yep. Very easy question. Um, where is the information on how to actually format a submission? So, um, oh, it's, it was actually on the previous. Quite a few things. Let me flick all the way back. Go here <laughs> <laughs> to the advanced qld.gov.au slash SBIR, and you'll see the challenge up there. And um, the application process through there. Yep. I'll just leave that up for a little while so you can write it down. Other questions? Nothing else coming through from Skype land? Okay, well we might finish a little bit early, which will give you a little bit of extra time for networking. Um, is there anything anyone on our panel wants to say before we finish up? No. Well, thank you again for your time and your interest in our challenge and coming here. Do take advantage of the networking session. We will have some um, refreshments um, coming through. Um, in, I think they're booked in for a little while, actually, but they're there now. Fantastic. So please go outside, have a drink, have a nibble, chat to each other, talk to each other about what you're doing, come up with those great multidisciplinary um, solutions that we're hoping for. And again, best of luck. So there's some team members going outside now that you can follow to the networking space.